What was I doing? We were going to read this paper on um, artificial intelligence and contemporary philosophy, Heidegger, Johnson, Slime Mold, Journal Philosophy by Masahiro Morioka. I apologize how I say your name and everyone else's name. And as always, please ask questions. If you want to keep asking me questions about other stuff, feel free to do so. The frame problem. In this paper, I provide an overview of today's philosophical approaches to the problem of intelligence in the field of artificial intelligence by examining several important papers on phenomenology and the philosophy of biology. There is no clear definition of artificial intelligence. Margaret T. Bowden writes in her recent book, AI, Its Nature and Future, that artificial general intelligence could have general powers of reasoning and perception plus language, creativity, and emotion. However, she does not forget to add, that's easier said than done. Bowden's concept of artificial general intelligence re resembles John Searle's strong AI, which was coined by Searle in 1980. According to Searle, while weak AI is a computer that can behave as if it were thinking wisely, strong AI is a computer that actually thinks like humans. Searle writes, according to Strong AI, the appropriately programmed computer really is a mind in the sense that computers given the right programs can literally can be literally said to understand and have other cognitive states. The theme of Strong AI was frequently discussed in the late 20th century. However, it became clear that in order for a computer to be a strong AI, it must resolve various difficult problems. The most difficult philosophical problem was the frame problem. The frame problem is the problem that AI cannot autonomously distinguish important factors from unimportant ones when it tries to cope with something in a certain situation. Ah, I for forgot this was called this. This is uh, how do you tell what's important and what's not. And the funny thing is, we still can't do this as people, but we can do it sometimes. We, all, we don't always know what's important. And just like as we were saying, when engaging with social media, how do we know what is the right sort of content to do it? How do we know what's important factor from the unimportant ones? If we knew how to do this, like we could make a lot of money. But like that's what marketing studies are for. Okay, this problem arises, for example, when we let AI robots operate in the real world. The frame problem was uh, proposed by John McCarthy and Patrick J. Hayes in 1969. This is considered a philosophical problem that cannot merely be reduced to a technical problem. Bowden writes in 2016 that claims that the notorious frame problem ha has been solved are highly misleading, which shows that even now many specialists think that the frame problem has not been solved. No. I don't think it's been solved and the idea that we can get a program that can automatically distinguish like what the difficulty is it's like saying can we have self-driving cars it's like yeah we can have self-driving cars but are would they guaranteed to know how to protect all human life no they're basically guaranteed to do what we have programmed to do them to do or Pro, um, act given the training data that we have given them. They cannot figure out new things that are novel, that don't count, that are very different from their training data. They can understand novel situations, but they can't do something that really was not in their training data. Okay, although there is no consensus about the definition of the frame problem, we could say that this problem is centered around the question of how we can make an AI memorize the tacit knowledge that almost all human adults can have in a given context. Um, if we trained AI on the internet, it would think boobs are the most important thing. Um, and why is that a problem, Vipers? No, I mean, jokes aside, every time we've put like a chat, they put a chat bot out on the internet it gets all it gets the uh, 4chan treatment which, which basically comes down to the thing that it's going to get the most engagement with is all the things that um the thing that it gets all the problem with is that it's going to get like you know the racism the anti-semitism all the things that will just get clicks and like uh, too much uh, attention and so it's just uh like that's the sort of thing that's the problem now it's also going to get boobs and things like that but it's like yeah sorry something but he yelled at me from outside here got distracted for a sec the herzog and zizek ai are kind of crazy though I have not seen those. That would be kind of fun because like, yeah, those are some like interesting, uh, like, like Zizek has a very particular way of talking. And so uh, for an AI to mimic, that would be a lot of fun actually. But yeah, so what gets the engagement and then you can figure it out. Boobs. Exactly. 
infiniteconversation.com, let's see. Let's go take a look real fast. Huh, maybe that's a trick. The uncontroversial stuff is the most important stuff. Well, that's how it is in like language. If you can if it could understand how to um you know, get prepositions, like all the little things. An AI generated never ending discussion between Werner Herzog and Slavoj Zizek. Everything you hear is fully generated by a machine. The opinions and beliefs expressed do not represent anyone. They are hallucinations of a slab of silicon. All right, that. Then we're going to do this, and then we're going to hit that. You know, I don't want to say too much at this point, but I have the feeling that we could work well together because our views are similar. Why don't you come over one day and bring a tape recorder? We would do an interview, and then I would immediately just speak free. Go ahead, don't worry. Just let me speak without any interruption. Don't interrupt me. Five minutes, maybe ten minutes, fifteen minutes, I would just speak. Yes, I would bring you in and we could work on a film together. It's, it's a very tempting proposal, but I must tell you that I cannot accept all my life, I have avoided these situations where people are publicly humiliated. I remember the castle. Near the end when the guy comes to buy the castle and he is in a room and then there is a door open and so on. You know how I hate that? I don't want to be seduced by the great Ersnai. I would rather, you know, use everything. I'd say, no, you are in an illusion. You are just bluffing. Don't humiliate me. I will walk away so you wouldn't get what you want. I don't know how to approach you, Anini. And this is not false modesty, I swear to you. Why don't you come over and we'll just be two people talking to each other without cameras? Oh, this is fantastic. I'd like that very much. Yes, come over. I hope it's not my Soviet heritage, but I don't like these situations. All right, yeah, this is completely fantastic. I could like, this could basically be like a screensaver, just have this going constantly. Oh my god, like like if this is not in like every philosophy department it should be. Yeah, I mean this is this is great. Yes, and you're like the constant like Zizek going like that. I mean whatever that actually is. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Oh. This I mean they really nailed the Zizek. Like it doesn't it sounds like like that sounds like it, him. So, that's funny. <sighs> well, thank you for that, uh, Chiron, MDD Chiron. Appreciate it. It's funny. All right, but anyway. And this is why we can't have nice things, because this is what we do. Like, no. It's just going to get eaten by the computer. And, like, people won't even know the difference between philosophers and, uh, like, non-philosophers. There you go. They certainly did. Thank you, MDD. Yes, you're always happy to... Uh, share the good word all right so we're gonna go keep talking about ai though for a bit although there is no consensus about the definition of the frame problem we could say that this is a problem centered around the question of how we can make an ai memorize tacit knowledge that almost all hu human adults can have in a given context imagine a waiter robot that serves meals and drinks for customers in a restaurant this robot must learn a series of knowledge and movements necessary for serving how much knowledge does this robot need to have to be able to adequately serve in, in an actual setting? First, the knowledge that when pouring too much water in a glass, the water overflows, is necessary for serving. And the knowledge that when we move a tray on which there is a glass, the glass also moves the tray is necessary as well because without such knowledge, the robot cannot remove the, remove the used glass and the, train, and the tray simultaneously. Moreover, we must input the knowledge such that when a robot moves the glass, the liquid inside the glass also moves with it. However, we do not have to input the knowledge that the liquid never evaporates by friction, heat caused by the movement of the tray because this knowledge has nothing to do with the robot's serving task. Considering this, it becomes clear that there is an infinite amount of knowledge the robot must memorize when serving, and there is also an infinite amount of knowledge it does not have to memorize. Who can make such a list of knowledge and how is it possible to make the robot memorize them? The reason why this happens is that when a robot encounters a new situation that it has never experienced, it cannot 
autom autonomously judge what kind of coping would be would be important to itself and what kind of coping would not and therefore it cannot adequately solve the problem it faces okay so like here's the thing we've been dealing with our hands our whole life to um you know hold glasses with water in them so we don't have to understand we don't have to be told all the knowledge of uh hands and cups and water because we've been doing that since we were that actually is water vipers um we don't have to be explained what what is actually like i was saying before my friend jovi from my minesweeper streaming days she was doing a drunk math stream and like so people were redeeming drink and she was drinking like you know some weak wine or something but like she was getting drunk and doing math and so it was funny but anyway um like we don't have to understand what it is to like grasp a cup but like that knowledge is not given to the robots and they can't understand about splashing water it's much harder and so the idea that we can like list all of that stuff it's like you can think about all the things you had to have to know to just reach over and grab a glass of water and you can't list all that stuff it's more uh some sort of knowledge of how to do something than what is going on Yeah, it is interesting that humans seem to be able to solve this kind of problem. Well, this is really a problem of epistemology. Our knowledge is different than the kind of things we program into computers quite often. A high school student can serve in a restaurant without problem if we give her a basic set of simple instructions. She will carry a tray back to the kitchen with an empty glass on it without any special instructions. Even if there occurs a new situation, she will try to solve the problem by taking a flexible approach on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, this is the sort of thing. We already know how to navigate our world. If we're trying to teach something how to navigate the world uh, from, like, nothing, like a robot, that's extremely difficult. Of course, we have, like, you know, like the Boston Dynamics thing that we sort of AI trained to move around and sort of can straighten itself out but that's again a very limited situation where the it's dealing with balance and getting uh tr going over terrain a very complicated problem but like again it's not a general solution it's a solution to how the robot can move over uh uneven tr terrain <clears throat> Concerning this topic, Hitoshi Matsubara had an interesting discussion in 1990. A subject that has a limited capacity of data processing, including computers and humans, can never reach a complete solution of general frame problems. However, in everyday settings, humans seem not to be annoyed by the frame problem. Considering this, what we have to think deeply about should be the question of why humans look to be free from the frame problem. This is the question of why, in many cases, human intelligence appears to successfully cope with unanticipated events in an open context, although humans do not have an empty, have enough capacity to completely solve the frame problem. Well, this is what I was saying. We can't solve the uh, what's important in social media, but we can somehow solve the problem with moving glasses of water around. Author says, I believe that human intelligence has the following special characteristics as compared with machine intelligence. One, when humans encounter unknown situations, they can make an adequate judgment using tacit knowledge and perform a certain action even if they do not have the complete list of knowledge necessary for performing it. That's tacit knowledge. So you can work under limited knowledge, basically, based on whatever they're calling tacit knowledge. Two, they can make an autonomous judgment about what kind of coping is truly important when they face an unknown situation and have, and have to survive it. So importance judgment, so you can rank uh, what your background knowledge. And three, they can choose a certain action and instantaneously perform it, violently ignoring other possible alternatives. Ignorance. So you can rank al uh, your, t your background knowledge and ignore all the other options immediately. It seems that artificial intelligence cannot have the above three characteristics. For artificial intelligence to have those characteristics, it must, ha must have the capacity to solve the frame problem we have d discussed so far. Recently, a series of st stimulating approaches to the frame problem have come out of the interdisciplinary field between artificial intelligence research and contemporary philosophy. In the following chapters, I will... Oh, so this is chapters? Maybe this is the introduction to a book or something. In the following chapters, I will examine two important discussions on this topic. Hubert Dreyfus's Heideggerian AI. Uh, Hubert Dreyfus just died recently. It's kind of sad. Well, in the last two years. 
All right, so Heideggerian AI and the biological approaches influenced by Hans Jonas' idea of metabolism. Um, and speaking of Hubert Dreyfus, um, or, may, or maybe just translated from Chinese, yeah, maybe there's a, uh, yeah, in the following sections, maybe not chapters. You, yeah, you might be right. It might be a, <laughs> I hope your burps are tasty, uh, vipers. But yeah, just so you know, Hubert Dreyfus had a, uh, a lecture series on um, AI, I think, or Heidegger, that overlaps with a lot of this stuff that you can find. It was given at Harvard a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago now. But like the audio from Hubert Dreyfus's um, talk uh, lectures on like uh, Heidegger and AI are available, so you can find this on the internet if you're interested in the Dreyfus take on Heidegger and AI. Okay. The former pays atten special attention to the Dasein and the body, Dasein being being, which is a Heideggerian term, which has a close relationship with today's phenomenology. The latter pays special, uh, special attention to the form of life or organism, which has a close relationship with today's philosophy of life and the theory of artificial life. Okay, Heideggerian AI. Hubert Dreyfus is a Heideggerian who has a long philosophically who has long philosophically criticized artificial intelligence from the inception of AI research. Here I would like to examine his 2007 paper, Why Heideggerian AI Failed and How Fixing It Would Require Making It More Heideggerian. Dreyfus also argues that the reason why artificial intelligence faces the frame problem is that it does not understand what kind of knowledge is important to itself in a given situation. This is like, how do you rank it? Uh, the knowledge is what I was saying ranking what is knowledge is important the importance of certain knowledge an event or an object has meaning only when it is placed in a concrete situation however the traditional AI research has presupposed the Cartesian model that puts our that our mind puts value on the world that is made up of meaningless objects and events Dreyfus stresses that this kind of research will never make artificial intelligence human intelligence or solve the frame problem he pays special attention to Martin Heidegger's distinction between Vorhandenheit, presence at hand, and Zuhandenheit, readiness to hand. In the book Sign and Sight, that's being in time for all you Americans, for example, seen from the Cartesian perspective, a hammer in front of me appears as an objectified tool in the state of presence at hand. On the contrary, if that hammer appears an, as an already encountered intimate tool that is interwoven in the web of meaning, which is made up of the apparent and hidden relationship between the hammer and the person, me who uses it, we can say that the hammer appears to me as an intimate tool in the state of readiness to hand. All right, I know that was a bad sentence and it's hard, but you can think of it more like, all right, so we're talking about eating some Chinese food. You can say, all right, I don't think any of you guys are Chinese. I don't know how... Um, experienced you are with chopsticks but like you can say look you, the chopsticks you can, if you are a native user or you've gotten so good with the chopsticks you can just eat food with chopsticks without thinking about it same for people who are grew up with using forks that is the readiness to hand you don't have to think about the use of chopsticks to eat food unless maybe you break your fork or you break your chopsticks but from a cartesian perspective that's the um presence at hand then you think about it well what is the chop the stick or the fork well chopsticks are just some sticks and the fork is you know it's pointy at one end and not so pointy at the other but that doesn't tell you how it's used the readiness to hand is being able to use it as an extinction of your hand being present at hand is well you can see it there and you can understand the properties but that doesn't actually give you um, an understanding of how it uses it Okay, system one and system two thinking in uh, terms you understand. Cool. I don't know where, where that's uh, those terms are from though. What's that? Is that a computer science and AI stuff? Okay. System one is fast, instinctive, and emotional. S system two is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. Okay. Um. That's getting there. This is different because, uh, like I said. The concept of being of using a hammer without thinking of it is the instinctive bit. Um, okay, it's the thinking fast and thinking slow by psychologist Daniel Kahneman. Okay, this is going to go beyond anything Kahneman does. Kahneman is yeah, a psychologist, but like this is going to go into the how you actually understand objects in the world. The fast, instinctive, and emotional, this is going beyond instinctive. You can use 
uh, chopsticks in an instinctive way, but it's going to be, um, you can learn this. It's not actually instinctive. It's going to be something that you can learn and acquire, but it's going to become such a part of your, the way you act in the world that it's going to be almost as if it were instinctive. But yeah, it's not really an instinct. It's more of a a habit that has become ingrained in the way you interact with the world. It's the old, if everything, is, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's more like what it is. Okay, and that's the readiness to hand. The presence at hand is, yeah, is the objective stuff. And that's fair. Okay, the traditional artificial intelligence lacks the capacity to understand this kind of readiness to hand. While every person can understand one, that when she exists in the world, she is always immersed in this kind of web of meaning. Traditional AI could not understand it. Yet, yeah, how do you explain to a computer your relationship with your tools like your fork or your chopsticks? How do you explain that? Like, I had to learn how to use chopsticks later in life. But, like, I can use them pretty well now. I can't explain that process to a computer. How I got to not thinking about using chopsticks. That's, like, a difficult thing to... Like, how did you take on that information of using chopsticks as an extension of your hand? Okay. Dreyfus argues that for the traditional AI to have the capacity to solve the frame problem and become a true artificial intelligence, it must become the Heideggerian AI that could implement the dimension of readiness to hand. He examined several studies by AI researchers in that direction, but he concludes that none of those have realized Heideggerian AI. First, he examines the robot of Rodney Brooks. Brooks is the inventor of subsumption architecture an insect-like hierarchy, hierarchical and dispersed system that is now used in the vacuum cleaner robot Roomba. Brooks' robot moves itself by continually referring to its sensors rather than to an internal world model. However, his robots respond only to fixed features of the environment, not to context or changing significance. So we must say that his robot does not have the capacity to solve the frame problem. Viper says, surely the ability to describe that presumes there is one kind of thinking and it exclu exclusively happens in the prefrontal cortex. Um, yeah, that's a fair criticism. It's like saying, well, there's one thing that you're doing is uh, what makes our thinking different. <sighs> Maybe. So here's the thing. I don't know about the brain science. Now, the metaphysics is going to get deep in terms of metaphysics. Heidegger is not a simple metaphysics. Like, it's not a simplistic metaphysics. Now, this is one feature of the metaphysics that Dreyfus is harping on. And so, will that actually be, like, if we could figure that out, like, where it works in the brain, would that be sufficient? I don't know. But, like, yeah, this is definitely, like, a criticism that uh, Dreyfus has raised. And I don't know if this... um author is op overly simplifying like the metaphysics. I don't know. He is overly simplifying the metaphysics. That's not a problem. But is that criticism, once you get past that one thing, is that going to be enough to really get at what it is to have our kind of intelligence? That's a different problem. But like, yeah, this is one criticism that Dreyfus raised and maybe it would be sufficient but uh, to, if once it's overcome that we would have it. So I don't know. But like, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, next, Dreyfus examines Phil Agre and David Chapman's program Pengi, which developed into Pengo, a video game which the avatar of a human player and penguin chases characters throw snowballs to each other on the screen. According to Agre, when they programmed this game, they referred to Heidegger's Seinunzeit and introduced the concept of de deictic intentionality in the game. De deictic intentionality does not point to a particular object, but to a role that an object might play in a certain time-extended pattern of interaction between an agent and its environment. This game has come to be able to treat the object that the agent reacts to as a function. Okay, so the game individuals can treat things as functions that they find, but they are not pre-programmed to do so. Dreyfus is critical of Agre and Chapman's approach. For example, when I put it, my hand on the door knob to leave the room, I am not experiencing the door as a mere door. Dyke tick. Okay, dyke tick. Sorry. Thank you. You just want to write dyke, didn't you? In such a situation, I am pushed toward the possibility of going outside through the room. Oh, no, no. 
going outside the room through this door, and the door solicit, solicits me to go outside through it. Agre and Chapman's artificial intelligence did not program this kind of experience in which the agent is solicited by affordance and, and activated by a given situation. Viper says uh, deictic uh, means relating to or denoting a word or expression whose meaning is dependent on the context in which it is used. Aha, thank you. I should know that, <laughs> but I, there's only so many things I can know. All right, this shows that they ended up with objectifying the functions they introduced and the importance of the situation for an agent. Dreyfus says that, in this sense, Agre and Chapman's artificial intelligence did not have the capacity to solve the frame problem. Yeah, because they gave it some ability to treat it in the right way, but it was a limited, uh, they had limited options for what they could do with it in that case. So even though they may have interacted with it in the correct method, it was only limited to that one thing that they had preset. Lastly, Dreyfus talks about Michael Wheeler's theory. Wheeler writes in his 2005 book, Reconstructing the Cognitive World, that the embodied embedded cognitive science that has been applied to artificial intelligence re research resembles Heidegger's philosophy. But Dreyfus criticizes him, saying that he also looks in the wrong place when considering the subject. Dreyfus's point is as follows. Although Wheeler insists that such embodied embedded artificial intelligence models are considered to be Heideggerian, it still remains inside the Cartesian model in which the events of the in the outer world are represented onto the sensors of artificial intelligence, and the AI's problem of solving is performed based on this representation. However, this representation model itself is the problem. We cannot fully understand human intelligence by this Cartesian model. All right, so this is basically saying, look, when you digitize the world in a certain way, that's Cartesian. You cannot be digitizing. And that's one of the big issues here. It's that even how your sensors are working is going to affect the interactions with the world. Dreyfus argues that Heidegger considers Dasein as being in the world, and there is no room for representations there, because that's what your sensors are doing. They are reducing it to a certain sort of, uh, you know, digitization, and that is going to be a representation. Dreyfus writes that being in the world is more basic than thinking and solving problems. It is not representational at all. Okay. Now, you got to worry at that point that we have sensors. Our eyes and our hands are going to only have certain limited kinds of information. And so is that not a representation in itself? Maybe not. Maybe that's not how we even interact with ourselves. But like, this is the question. We have eyes. Like you could put glasses on it and then the world looks different when you're wearing your glasses. We do this every day. I mean, you don't need to have like corrective lenses. You could be wearing sunglasses and then everything's darker. And so the world appears darker at that point. Is that a representation or have we modified the world in a, uh, in a way that is actually pre-representational or non-representational? What does that mean? What is a representation at that point? But they're saying, look, anytime you're digitizing and presenting the digital world to the uh, intelligence, then you have added a step that is going to be interfering with actually being in the world. You've added a digitization step. Okay. When a person tries to solve problems, the boundary between that person and her tools disappears. That's what I was trying to say, that there is no representation when I'm using a fork or chopsticks at this point. You're not thinking about it, you're just doing it. There is no intermediary step. That person has already lived inside the world, and for skilled copers, they are not minds at all, but one with the world. In the most basic sense, we are absorbed copers. It is very hard to clearly say whether the absorbed, pro absorbed problem solving is performed inside oneself or in the world because the distinction of inside and outside is not an easy thing to do. Yeah, so when you use, like, say, you know, a pen and you're not thinking about how to, like, do it, where is the problem of how solved with how to write the pen? Is it with the, is it in your hand where you're getting feedback constantly or is it in your head sort of telling your hand what to do, but your head's not telling your hand actually how to be a hand? Your hand already is the hand and it's doing stuff. And so where is it? Is it inside your head or is it in the world in your hand, like outside in the world as my hand is? The basis of Heideggerian AI should be Dasein's being in the world. And artificial intelligence should be Dasein, and its way of existing should be being in the world. An artificial intelligence that does not have this mode of existence should not be called Heideggerian, and therefore it cannot have the capacity to solve the frame problem. Yeah, how does it actually 
if there is a representation going on, you know you're not thinking about your hand when you're writing using your hand. How can a computer do something if it's adding this extra step? It's not going to have our kind of intelligence. Okay, in the case of humans, they can improve their skills of coping with important changes in the world by their embodied capacity of problem solving. Embodied means using your body, like in your hand. For example, when we are in a room, we, are, we usually ignore many changes therein, but if the temperature goes extremely high, the windows of the room solicit us to open them, and we react to that solicitation and open the windows. In this case, the problem of solving so in, in this case, the problem solving is made by reacting to the affordance of the environment. Dreyfus writes about the reason why humans can solve the frame problem as follows. In general, given our experience in the world, whenever there is a change in the current context, we respond to it only if in the past it has turned out to be significant. And when we sense a significant change, we treat everything else as unchanged except what our familiarity with the world suggests might also have changed, and so needs to be checked out. Thus, a local version of the frame problem does not arise. In the case of humans, our familiarity with the world is always activated tacitly in our cognition, and what is important to us is automatically distinguished from what is not important to us. This function deters the frame problem from arising. Yeah, and this is saying basically we have a, a stock understanding of how things we have a what's it called like you know a nominal state we understand what the world is nominally that computers do not have or robots do not have they have what we have given them but they do not have like our instincts of a nominal world and once we get and once something gets out of nominal we are trying to you know understand that one thing but that allows us to order the importance of things in our world what has gone wrong what has gone away from the baseline and so the way we interact with the world is like we interact with it like we interact with pens. We don't think about how to write anymore. And we do that all the time with the whole thing. But that's already assuming a lot of knowledge of how the world already is. And this is something we can't give a robot without giving it a whole human life. Okay. When we must change the context ourselves, the frame problem again emerges. We can we, when can we recognize the fact that the problem exists in the peripheral area come to the center of our problem-solving tasks? Dreyfus says, referring to Merleau-Ponty, that such recognition is caused by summons from their affordance. From the affordance. In essence, when something very important happens to us, we can recognize it by solicitations or summons made by the world we live in, and without accepting this kind of model, we can never solve the frame problem. Um, you can think of something as uh, grabbing your attention. The summons is something that changes your attention and this is a so when something grabs your attention it it does so because it has gone away from the nominal state so when something grabs your attention then it causes you to do something because you've drawn been, your attention has been drawn to that thing like so when it gets too hot it grabs your attention that you're getting too hot and then you look to undo that that uh thing that grabbed your attention you bring it down you open the window or whatever dreyfus concludes that for artificial intelligence to acquire such acquire such capacity we would have to include in our program a model of a body very much like ours with our needs desires pleasures pains ways of moving cultural backgrounds etc yeah you'd have to give it a full human being which is the heideggerian term you need it it would need to have a dasein which is a way of humans are being it, okay, author says, it seems that Dreyfus, Heideggerian AI, should have a human-like body and live in that body from the inside. However, is it possible for current AI robots made up of silicon chips, metals, and plastic to satisfy such high requirements? In the next chapter, we examine biological approaches, which are completely different from Heideggerian AI. <clears throat> yes, Vipers, we do dream of pizza and electric pizza. Uh, and uh i mean i don't know if you've seen the little video of like rats stealing pizza so like new york rats also dream of rat pizza um yeah <sighs> new yorkers dream of rent not being so expensive that's what we dream of <coughs> artificial intelligence and metabolism there is a group of researchers who think that for artificial intelligence to have the capacity to solve the frame problem, it should be a kind of organism or a life form before it can acquire a human-like body. 
When facing fatal difficulties, organisms try to survive by using every possible measure. Organisms have such innate capacities. Those researchers believe that these innate capacities that organisms have for survival must be the foundation needed for the resolution of the frame problem. Hans Jonas, who was once a disciple of Heidegger, stressed the importance of the concept of metabolism in the field of philosophy of biology, and this concept has made a huge influence on the above approaches. Jonas published the book The Phenomenon of Life in 1966, and is a German edition, uh, that German words, in 73. Why are you keep crashing? I have to fix this. Uh, we'll do that. Let me try and fix it again for the fucking third or fourth time. This is my own fault. At this point, I should have fixed it. I'm sorry about this. Okay. So, so this is a... Yeah. I, I like my, like, I think I, this is my fault. I changed something uh, a week ago with my uh, software, and I think it's causing problems. I do not, uh, I really do like this uh, software, though. It's uh, called Sammy Solutions for its uh, oh, free uh, Stream Deck software. So, it's very good. So, connect, 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 damn it. Hopefully it'll connect or something. Whatever's. We'll find out. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is an original philosophy of biology. He thinks that freedom came into existence when ancient microbes with cell membranes emerged on the earth. So this is freedom came into existence when ancient microbes showed up. These microbes take in nutrition and through, and through the membrane and ex taking nutrition through the membrane and excrete waste out through the membrane. By this kind of continuous intake and immersion of tiny particles through the membrane, the microbes can maintain their lives. As time passes, all the materials forming the cell are replaced. Nevertheless, the living cell maintains its identity on a different dimension. Jonas sees here the liberation of life from the dimension of matter. This liberation is, Jonas thinks, the freedom the form of life acquires. On the other hand, life is bound by the replacement process of the tiny particles through the membrane. If this replacement process stops, life is destined to disappear because it, it is by this replacement process that life can maintain itself. In this sense, life depends on matter. Jonas calls this kind of freedom dependent freedom or impoverished freedom. Life's survival is always threatened by this potential risk. Life is destined to survive by performing the continuous replacement of its contents. If life neg neglects efforts to replace materials, it will face its own death. Life is essentially fragile because without continuous efforts to survive, it will soon perish. When Jonas was thinking about the above idea, he was not imagining artificial intelligence. His thoughts on life and freedom were discussed only within a small circle of philosophers of biology at that time. However, after his death in 1993, Jonas' philosophy soon began to dis be discussed outside the field of biology. One of the philosophers who shed a strong light on Jonas was Francisco J. Varela, who advocated the concepts of autopeosis in the field of biology and, and activism in the field of phenomenology and artificial intelligence. In the seminal paper, Life After Kant, written by Andreas Weber and Varela, published in 2002, Varela's posthumous publication, um, for some reason, I, uh, this got brought up recently in Roulette, I forget why, but we, this uh, was uh, referenced recently. They try to connect Varela's autopoiesis with Jonas' metabolism. They write that autopoiesis is the necessary empirical grounds for Jonas' theory of value, and that these two ideas, autopoiesis and metabolism, are not only contem contemporaneous, but fully complementary. Both seek a hermeneutics of the living, that is, to understand from the inside the purpose and sense of the living. In both theories, the key term were the membrane of a cell and its metabolism. Jonas and Varela try to think that a single cell that has a membrane contains intrinsic teleology, and this cellular organism has a basic purpose in the maintenance of its own identity and affirmation of life. Varela's attention on Jonas' philosophy of biology, especially his emphasis on metabolism, made a huge impact on some of the researchers of artificial intelligence. Tom Froze and Tom Zimke 
Tom Zimke's paper, Inactive Artificial Intelligence, Investigating the System Systemic Organization of Life and Mind, published in 2008, is an endeavor to develop Jonas' idea of metabolism in the field of artificial intelligence. Froze and Zimke interpret the frame problem as follows. It is the problem of how to how is it possible to design an artificial system in such a manner that relevant features of the world actually show up as significant from the perspective of that system itself rather than only in the perspective of the human designer or observer. They refer to Dreyfus's paper and stress that the frame problem has not been resolved and they go on to say that contributions uh, contributions from phenomenology and theoretical biology are necessary for the solution of this problem. Yes, yeah, like how do you actually decide what's important? That's the question from above. Like features of the world show up as significant from the perspective of that system. It's like how do you judge what's important in the world? Very hard thing to answer. Frozen Zimke say that in recent years an embodied turn occurred in cognitive science. However, we still do not know how to teach an AI to understand important problems for itself in an autonomous manner. They focus attention on Jonas' philosophy of biology. They write that the existence of what could be described by an external observer as goal-directed behavior does not necessarily entail that the system under study itself has those goals. They could be extrinsic, that is externally imposed, rather than intrinsic, that is internally generated. Is it really difficult to decide what is important? And Fernal asks. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes no. Most of the time, um, when it comes to people, we have some very good ideas about what's important for our lives and why. Like if you're thirsty, you need to drink and you know that's important. A computer does not have that inherent thirst. And that's what they're saying right here. We can tell it that it needs power, but like if the computer runs low on power, it can't tell you that it's running low on electricity. Like, if, you know, it can just like, you know, you'll, you'll notice that things start breaking, but it doesn't understand that it's running low on electricity. This way we, we might feel that we're hungry. So can we, is it hard for us to know certain things are important? No, but is it hard? Um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you get people having existential crisis. They don't know what's important in their life. They don't know what to do with themselves. They get midlife crises. And so it can be very difficult in like the wider world, but like in our own small little lives, not really. But like if you start asking bigger questions, yes. And so the problem is for to tell a computer what's important, we're generally what they're saying right here is that we're putting our important goals on it but for it to actually have generated internally generated as they say right here um then yeah it's really hard because the computer has no method for generating that itself the computer doesn't understand that there's electricity going into it that runs it like we understand about food and water and air going into us and so it doesn't have that sort of uh reaction to you know choking or being hungry like, it doesn't understand what that is. And so, how would you give a computer the understanding of choking or being hungry? It's harder. Okay. If an AI robot has its own goals, they should be generated from inside the robot spontaneously. Like, being hungry is generated spontaneously. But how does that happen? How can you make a, a robot hungry? They argue that the question we should ask would be what kind of body the robot must have for it to accomplish such a task. Viper's Gratitude says, When I was a teenager, I read A Brief History of Time. It blew young Viper's mind. This analysis of the nature of the universe seemed like the most important thing I'd ever read, but I learned after some squirming that sometimes it is more important to pee. Yeah. Um. But how do you teach a robot to pee? Like that sometimes it is more important. So like we understand this because we in some sense will die if we don't pee. You will get event you will eventually get a uh, you know, sick if you don't like get rid of your waste urine. Um But like this is like we're getting down to like basic biological functions. I mean the metabolism here is what they're talking about. And so it's like we have this thing that we consider the metabolism, which is where we're getting to. And that gives us a sense of what we need to do to keep ourselves alive. The computers do not have a sense of metabolism that keeps them running. They just don't. Juggling said, even if an AI can 
can make maps of priorities and has a training environment to mimic the entire human experience of one person, it still won't understand what it truly means to die unless it has some kind of synthetic flesh to mimic decay. The ending of the movie by Centennial Man ends on the note that dying is part of the experience. And well, that's exactly a Heideggerian point actually there, that it is the interaction with the world, with the body that you, like you can lose part of your body, like you can, uh, you can lose your body in death. Do you truly understand what it means to die? I mean, I don't know. Probably not. Um, but, like, I understand something about what it means to die. Does a computer understand what it means to die? Vipers, do any of your programs know what it means for them to self-term... Like, their termination? Like, do any of them under have any understanding or any concept of when they're going to ter terminate and what that means? Of course, we don't know when we're going to die any more than a program knows when it's going to terminate. Can't happen. That's one of those, like, problems you can't do. So it's like, do I? No, I don't know any of that. But I understand something about the uh, extinction of human life. Um, does the operating understand something about the length of a program that is running on it? Um, I don't think it it does. I mean, we have representations that we use to like map this stuff out but does the operating system itself understand that i mean it has some numbers and it can click down but does it actually does that mean anything to that like is that intrinsic there or is that the numbers clicking down externally imposed and i think the answer is no it does not actually understand what it is for those numbers to click down saying we're gonna kill this program in like 10 seconds or something and so this is a thing like so yeah frank big time first time chat says welcome in anyway i think the most likely state of things is that no current program understands death but that there is no hard barrier no reason to think that a program 10 years from now cannot understand aloha yes aloha welcome in mahalo um i think there's very good reason to think that a program 10 years from now cannot understand we don't have a good understanding of it ourselves the idea that a program is going to come up with a, an answer is going to do it is like i don't see why it would when we have no real way of doing it at the moment it's not like we can just make a computer smarter by adding more ram um i mean if you could just go download more ram into your computer and like all of a sudden would figure stuff out it's not how it works like you have to give it better programs to let it do more things but again if we can't we're talking about how to program in here we don't even know how to program is what these people are arguing we don't understand the programming required for this um so it's not just 10 years it's like we have to have better ideas first now of course, we don't understand death entirely ourselves, but could we program something understanding that it's, it has its own termination? Um, yes, but would that the computer really understand that, or would that be our concept of termination that somehow the computer is like representing and not actually being like, oh, I could terminate myself, and what would that mean for me? That's the question here. Would it understand what it is to like stop running? And I don't think it has any concept of what it is to run itself. That is, it has no understanding of its own metabolism. That we are feeding it electricity to make the programs run. Like, that we understand we have to eat food to keep our body healthy. And, like, move around or else we die. Like, the computer doesn't know that. Even if we gave it a body, it wouldn't know that. Where would it get such knowledge? We could give it, like, programs to represent this, but how would it have that internal drive? Would we normally say that a three-year-old human isn't real intelligence if they don't understand death? Um, no, of course not. We don't think three-year-olds know much of anything. But um, we understand that adult humans do. Um, and there's a lot of history there that says that adults understand these things. And so we don't understand how three-year-old humans grow up either. It's like we don't understand human development and human minds. And so using a three-year-old, comparing it to computer... We don't have any like older comp computers that do understand this. So we could say the three-year-old will understand when they get older. We don't have any three-year-old computers or thirty-year-old computers that understand that now understand, but not when they were three. Oh, uh, Cruz Teet, welcome in. Hi, you want to offer promotion? You're so kind. Thank you. I do like these more polite bots, though, as opposed to just like buy views. As well as I'd like to offer promotion to your channel. Well, I thank you, bot. At least you've learned some, uh, you know, manners. <coughs> yeah. So back to what Frank says. 
Yeah, uh, Viper. <laughs> Thank you for actually taking your job seriously, Vipers. You can right click on the name, um, and you'll, or you can click on the name, and it will uh, pop up some options uh, very uh, conveniently. Um, so that's the sort of stuff you can do. You can right click, or you can just click. The, the right click is, I think, a little bit newer. The regular click, you'll get a lot of different things. <laughs> Welcome to the annoying job of being a moderator on the internet. <laughs> uh, this is funny. <laughs> this is very funny to me. Vipers was like shocked to be mod and now I was like, oh my god, I have to take it seriously. <laughs> okay. Yeah, continue to ask me questions. Like, I like the questions. It gets me to explain this stuff uh, better, I guess. Yeah. Okay, Froze and Zimke refer to Jonah's idea of metabolism and discuss the difference between an artificial system and a living system. The mode of existence of an artificial system is by is being by being. An artificial system can act, but this action is not necessarily done for its own survival. On the contrary, the mode of existence of a living system is being by doing. Oh, an artificial system is being by being. A living system is being by doing. Frank Big Time says, I think that what you are saying, that we don't sufficiently understand the development of intelligence in humans, and therefore we don't know how to mimic it in programs, is quite true. But I think it also implies that we, we will not have a good sense of when we are creating something that should count as intelligence. I completely agree with that. I don't think we actually know at the moment um, what it would entail. Now, that's not to say we don't know a lot of wrong directions, because we have a lot of uh, negative results. So we do have an idea of when we're messing things up. So that's um, fair, that we don't have a sense that we are creating something that should, but we also know when it's not working, so we have negative stuff. Um, so we know when we're going wrong, we may not know when we're going right. I think that's probably true. Um, we need better theories at the moment to actually know how to do it right. A living system must engage in certain self-constituting operations, that is, the continuous replacement of tiny materials through the membrane of the cell. If a li living system stops the replacement actions, it will die. It disappears from the world. Doing or acting is necessary for a living system, but not so for an artificial system. This is the crucial difference between an artificial system and a living system, and this is exactly what Jonas wanted to stress by the words dependent freedom. Jonas was discussing this topic against the backdrop of cybernetics and the general system general systems theory of the 1960s. Frozen Zimke revived Jonas' idea in the age of artificial intelligence in the 21st century. Yeah. It is very difficult to make a metabolizing artificial intelligence, but they argue that the fundamental reason why AI cannot solve the frame problem lies in the fact that AI does not have the biological way of being. Being by doing. Alright, so just so everyone can point out, this is all metaphysics -y here. When you're talking about ways of being, this is um, a term of metaphysics is what Heidegger was going on. How are we being the way we are in the world? And so this is a concept that we don't have um, in sort of like, it's just only a metaphysical term. And so this is basically saying, look, we don't have our we don't have a way of having this metaphysics in artificial in uh, intelligence at the moment. It's a metaphysics beyond our capacity for programming. For example, even if we switch off an artificial intelligence and after we after that we switch it on, it will continue to operate without any special problems. However, if it is a life form, once it dies, it will never live again. This sense of urgency that when it dies everything is over characterizes the life form's way of being. They argue that here lies the door to the solution of the frame problem. Alright, this is saying look, you have to have a knowledge of death that well you don't have this just ongoing uh, algorithm you just can't keep going once the there is an actual end and this is giving you a sense of urgency to life that you have to keep doing these replacement things this is also like in from heidegger yeah <clears throat> the uh you have time horizons on objects so our life has a horizon that we are that you know gives it a uh yeah, a horizon an end in sight that you eventually get to your demise um Okay, they say that we should pay attention to the fact that a life form actively generates and sustains the systematic I systemic identity under precarious conditions. They call this mode of being constitutive autonomy following Varela's naming. They say that constitutive autonomous systems bring forth their own identity and domain of interactions and thereby constitute their, 
their own problems to be solved according to their particular affordances for action. They make a theoretical analysis of artificial intelligence with constitutive autonomy and try to find a possible combination between artificial intelligence and artificial life. So here's the thing, like you're, if you're giving like artificial life one of these things, then you can then maybe track back once you have one of these artificial lives what it is to be artificially intelligent in this artificial life so there's a different strategy you make uh like fake cells or artificial cells that have like this sort of like characteristic of life and then see what those cells know okay first they point out the possibility of a microbe robot symbiosis for example, if we can reflect the state of microbes that is incorporated into a robot onto the robot's controller, the autonomous movement of the microbes could be inscribed onto the intelligence of the robot on a real-time basis. So yeah, if you had some sort of um, like game of life going on, little bots, then that could be doing something intelligent in a robot's brain. Like, this could be done. They also argue that by incorporating the principle of tessellation automate automaton into a robot, we might use their characteristic that although the production principle is not intelligent, the outcome looks intelligent when observed from the outside. They stress that such a system has not been created by anyone in that and that in order to develop a better theory of the biological roots of intentional agency, we first need to gain a better understanding of bacterium level intelligence. Only by returning to the beginnings of life itself do we stand any chance of establishing a properly grounded theory of intentional agency and cognition. Viper says, I disagree with the idea that, the con that a concept of ending is required to solve the frame problem. It's a poetic idea, but it doesn't make sense. Like, you don't need, you don't see despondent three-year-olds because they have no knowledge of death. No, I completely agree. I don't think that's right. But, but I think they were wrong up here when they said this stuff. Um about needing it they're getting much better when they get down here um where they're saying look maybe we have to go back to the beginnings i think this is a slightly better idea like what does a cell know not does the cell need to understand its death clearly um like microbes do not understand the concept of death now do microbes have a concept of having to maintain themselves yes now do you does that maybe imply that once it stops maintaining itself you, something bad will happen perhaps i don't know but like I, I don't i agree with you that this is a bit over the top like a lot of people freak out once they realize they're gonna die but like uh they were getting along just fine before that It seems to me that their argument that to develop a spontaneous artificial intelligence, we have to go back to the bacterial, bacteria level, is stimulating and reasonable. Margaret A. Bowden also stresses the importance of metabolism by citing Hans Jonas and concludes that if metabolism is a necessary condition for mind, strong AI should be impossible because the metabolism can be modeled by computers but not instantiated by them. Jonas' metabolism model might be the deepest key for understanding artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, it has to want to be alive in some sense, or it has to do this sort of thing to maintain itself. And as soon as like you say, like, well, why do we stay alive? Well, we're hungry. We have to eat stuff to breathe, to do things, or we have to breathe. Computers are not doing this. They have no reaction to being hungry. We can only program in a sort of representation of hunger and then them act on that but that gets to the representation problems we talked about earlier in the uh in the paper that this is a not how we exist in the world all right so slime mold and bio computer so i guess this is where we're going with the uh The paper thinks, all right, so what basically we're going to do is we're going to start making a computer that has biological components that have this drive to keep the computer alive. Okay. The endeavor to investigate intelligence by going back to the bacteria level has already begun. All right. Just, I want to be clear. <laughs> I don't think we have to go to bacteria to get intelligence, but it's not, it's an interesting way to go about the problem. All right. Continuing. Among them, the slime mold computer, which has been studied by Toshiyuki Nakagaki and Ryo Kobayashi, is particularly worth mentioning. They discovered in 2000 that when putting food at two separate places on a small maze made of glass on the surface of which they had they have spread out starving slime mold, the slime mold slowly transforms its whole cell to make it the shortest route between the two places. The slime mold 
uh, limbs that are on a dead end route start to retreat from it, join the main route that is connected with the food and help thicken the cross sections of the main route made by the slime mold. In this way, slime mold makes a kind of calculation by itself, discovers the shortest route between two places, and modifies its body to the most efe efficient shape for that route. This action performed by starving slime mold eloquently shows the fundamental mode that life forms seek to maintain their existence in a precarious situation. In their 2011 paper, Performance of Information Processing in a Primitive Organism of True Slime Mold, in Japanese, Nakagaki and Kobayashi argue that this kind of action for survival by slime, by slime mold is made by the calculation performed by the slime mold itself. That is to say, the action for survival emerges inherently and spontaneously inside the slime mold, calculations searching for the most adequate solution are performed, and the slime mold transforms itself in accordance with the solution. This can be called a biological calculator, and I presume that the frame problem might be solved in the slime mold case. If we give the slime mold a new difficult task and track it down, it would certainly rethink its strategy for the new condition and try to transform its body toward a new adequate solution. The slime mold seems to have the capacity to continuously adapt itself to unknown changes in the environment by transforming its body in an emergency. Oh, if yeah, the slime mold navigating maces is fascinating. And right here, Vipers, you can um Two, mov uh, two movies, uh, what's it called? Dark City and uh, The Matrix before they changed it to being a power plant. Both were using humans as um, in this exact way. They were putting humans into basically ways to uh, new and more difficult problems to see how humans would actually solve the problem. They changed The Matrix because they thought this concept was too difficult. Um, they turned humans into a power plant because it was simple, um, but basically, and also in Dark City, uh, we have an alien species at that point that are using humans basically as rats and mazes, like slime molded mazes, to figure out new and efficient ways of doing stuff and using human life as this way as we are using slime mold in this case, solving more complex problems. Nakagaki and Kobayashi made a mathematical simulation model for tracing the movement of slime mold physerum solver and investigated its behavior. As a result, they discovered that the... <coughs> oh dear, I'm losing it. As a result, they discovered that the calculation the slime mold makes is not inaccurate and perfect, but rough and ready... Rough and, rough and speedy. Thank you, Vipers. Drink again. Yeah, things use heuristics. That's basically the... That's how things do stuff. They argue that such a rough and speedy calculation is a noteworthy characteristic of biological computation. Although they do not mention this, I believe that this characteristic of biological computation might be the key to creating human-like intelligence. Intelligence that, when encountering a new environment, can speedily judge which factors is most important to it and act violently, ignoring other non-important factors. This kind of intelligence is necessary for solving the frame problem. Kobayashi also writes in his 2015 paper, Autonomous Decentralized Control Found in Creatures from Slime Mold to Robot in Japanese, that while most robots can move correctly in the anticipated environments, animals can move in a tough manner even if they encounter unknown environments. He argues that animals have the capacity to solve the frame problem, and these animals uh, include not only mammals and insects, but also slime mold. Kobayashi argues that insects and slime mold can take spontaneous decentralized control over their bodies. This su suggests that to solve the frame problem, the development of a spontaneously decentralized body system would be better than that of a centralized control system like a central nervous system. Kobayashi says that his snake-like self-moving robot might have such a decentralized system and that he proposes the development of the control system that makes the environment its friend. These studies suggest that the inherent spontaneous solution of the frame problem made by humans is performed not by the human central nervous system, but by the decentralized control system located at every part of the body that is free from the control of the central nervous system. However, it should be noted that Brooks subsunk subsumption architecture has not succeeded in solving it. 
Frozen Zimke's microbe robot's biosis might be a possible answer. They propose to insert a colony of microbes into the body of a robot, but isn't there another possibility in the opposite direction? The possibility to insert artificial objects such as super micro artificial intelligence, super micro robots, or the fragments of artificially structured DNA or RNA into the cells of microbes. It might be possible to create the symbiotic systems of a group of such super micro artificial objects and microbes. Uh, really? So, okay, so basically we're turning ourselves, our computers into viruses. So what a virus does is, is it injects little bits of uh, RNA into um, cells, creating, causing the cell to make more and more of the virus, which then, you know, spreads out. And so what they're saying is basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making virus computers here, where instead of making more copies of the um, virus, you're going to be solving mathematical equations by getting the cell to act in that way. Uh, via sort of a virus activity. Now, there's actually argument that viruses aren't alive. They're just sort of self-replicating machines, not really alive. It's just, they just replicate. They're, pro they're replicating proteins. They don't actually have life. But, um, okay, I'm a little dubious about this, but, like, this is basically what they're saying. They're saying turning uh, viruses into computers. Why would anyone want to bring a Skynet into the world like this? Well, this is where we're going on this stuff. Um, if you're going to make a Skynet, like if you're going to make some sort of singularity, would you have to start at the basic level, like from like ground up where the computers exist even at the DNA level? So like DNA is some sort of stuff. Um, scary stuff, Ann says. Yeah, I, well, I'm rather dubious. I don't think this is going to work. So it's no different from any other stuff we've been doing that hasn't worked yet, in my my opinion. But, like, building it into, like, mold and stuff and having it do, like, sort of, like, semi-intelligent computer stuff. Well, yeah, Skynet is scary. Um, it's like, I don't really, th like, I'm not sure this will actually work. It's just getting the computer and the life at a much more... Like, they're built in together, but the idea that, like, the the, symbi the symbiosis is really going to imbue the computer with what the life has, I'm not sure how that's working. The fact that they say there's some sort of symbiotic rela relationship here is, I'm not sure what that is. But they're saying, look, if we build it in together, then it will somehow get, the life will get into the computer, and the computer will get into the life. That's not explained how. They're just saying we're building it in together. And so why is there symbiosis? Why is there some sort of working together here? The computer stuff isn't going to work together. It doesn't know how to work together with life. It just does what we program it to. So I don't really buy this claim of symbiosis at the moment. And that's what I'm thinking. Okay. All right, take the example of slime mold. We might give slime mold the capacity of calculation that is enhanced by super micro robots, super micro processors, or artificially made nucleic acids. Such artificially enhanced slime mold could not only solve the shortest path problem inherently and spontaneously, but it could also solve more difficult tasks by calculation. See, it doesn't say how this happens right here. I mean, yes, Skynet, like, reality is scary, but, like, the idea that, like, it could also do this other stuff, how would it understand what the calculation is doing? The slime mold does not understand math. You can't, like, build in, build in a computer into slime mold and have it understand, like, what 3 times 2 is. Like, it doesn't understand, it does not understand the number 6. It just doesn't. <clears throat> okay. In such a case, we could suppose that this slime mold must have the capacity to discover the problem that is important for its own survival and to solve that problem by spontaneous calculation. <coughs> so we've got a video from Juggling Biohazard. There's an interesting short bit of what AI thinks human evolution will look like. <laughs> this is what human AI, human developed AI thinks that human evolution will look like. So we're, we're two things removed. Oh, this is a short. Let's uh, try copy. I mean, you know, let let me get to the end of this paper actually before like having some fun stuff. We're getting uh towards the end right here. Like that's it. Okay. A slime mold. Uh, Viper says I find it interesting that these ideas from a Japanese philosopher are injecting images from the end of Incure into my mind. No, I mean the Japanese have had um a lot of this thought actually uh. 
because there's some Heidegger, Heidegger scholars that were some big Japanese philosophers. So the idea that like we, they didn't have these ideas floating around in their culture, that's the path of some of these ideas goes through Japan. And so the idea that they have these thoughts in their culture is not actually all that off the mark of Vipers. Um, so yeah. Frank Big Time says, it sounds almost like they're using slime molds to append RNG goals to make sure we aren't imposing go human goals. Yeah, that's. I think that's right, Frank. They're trying to get uh, into the slime mold some sort of uh, our idea of what artificial intelligence is. Now, I don't know how well the, like, the, I don't think the slime mold would understand what we're telling it. And so I'm not sure how well that would work. But like, if you're talking about like Japanese, like pop media, I mean, go look at a uh, Ghost in the Shell, the original movie. Like they're like almost explicitly arguing about all this stuff. I love Ghost in the Shell. Oh my god. <sighs> okay, where was it? A slime mold as an organism is considered to have the capacity to solve the frame problem. Slime mold with the capacity of calculation that is artificially enhanced should also have the capacity to solve the frame problem. Yes, but would it would it have the capacity to understand what the enhancement is doing? It does not understand numbers. So it may still understand the frame problem, but it's not going to understand the computer problems. Artificially enhanced slime mold should be considered a kind of biocomputer. In the context of computers, biocomputers are the key to the solution of the frame problem. This is the provisional conclusion of this paper. Okay, so this is what they're coming out and saying. Look, if we can enhance living things to solve our problems like rats and a uh, psych maze but we can enhance uh you know like slime mold to do more complex problems or problems that rats and us uh, uh like a little maze can't do then maybe we will start to make a more capable uh, computer okay one philosophical problem emerging from our discussion is if the frame problem is to be solved by an organism's spontaneous decentralized control, then the frame problem could be solved without the realization of the Heideggerian AI proposed by Dreyfus, which exists in the mode of being in the world. The frame problem might not be the problem at the level of the central nervous system that executes simple manipulations, but the problem at the level of metabolism-based, spontaneously decentralized control systems. Since Dreyfus would have presupposed the control by the central nervous system, his idea could have been completely wrong. Some people say that the recent development of deep learning will perhaps succeed in solving the frame problem, but the capability of deep learning is still not clear. The above discussions depend on how we understand the essence of the frame problem. This is the question philosophers should tackle head on. As seen above, we have tried to give an overview of the connection between the frame problem, Heideggerian AI, metabolism-based AI, the spontaneous, spontaneously decentralized control system by slime mold, and a future pro possible solution of the frame problem by biocomputers. We find there are several stimulating themes for contemporary philosophy, researchers of philosophy will take interest in the fact that the names of Heidegger and one of his greatest disciples, Jonas, appear in our discussion of the frame problem. I am not an AI research specialist, so if there are any misleading expressions or incorrect uses of technical scientific words in this paper, please let me know. There is tremendous risk in research on making artificially enhanced slime mold. We must prevent the uncontrolled runaway of artificially enhanced slime mold. Yes, our, we, we, Skynet is really slime mold. That's what we have done. Hey, Lucifer, how you been? Good evening. We're just finishing up a paper on um, different ways of tackling one of the big problems in artificial intelligence, the frame problem, which is how do we judge the important things in, uh, in our world? Like uh, without us imposing something on computers, um, how do the computers just, could they spontaneously understand what's important? And this uh, person, this uh, researcher is suggesting that we build the computers into things that already judge what's important in the world, like slime mold. Okay, so this research intends to give slime mold high-level calculation capacities. This is, uh, wow. I mean, this is, uh, interesting, but like, yes, we're gonna hook supercomputers up to slime mold. If they are emitted into the environment, they might cause devastating damage to humans and ecosystems. Hence, the research ought to be carried out at the highest biosafety level and facility facilities that have the capacity for physical containment stipulated by the Cartagena Protocol. In the first place, we cannot imagine how slime mold would behave when its capacity of calculation is enhanced. 
yeah, well, this is getting into straight up sci-fi at this point. There might be the risk of that artificially enhanced slime mold with high level intelligence could proliferate on a huge scale and cover the whole earth searching for food. In the case of toxic microbes, research on giving them high level calculation capacities should not be allowed. This kind of research can also be seen as enhancement research using artificial objects with microbes as their targets. Therefore, this topic is connected with bioethics discussion on enhancement. Yeah, like, are we allowed to, like, modify the stuff? <laughs> Vipers, yeah, that's exactly right. Is how we turn the blob into the thing. <laughs> you nailed it. Okay, while artificial intelligence has supported biotechnical biotechnological research in many ways in the future there will appear a completely different situation in which AI research is directly combined with the manipulation of organisms in the field of biotechnology we must have an intensive and interdisciplinary discussion before it becomes a reality we can conclude that the gulfs between AI research biology and philosophy have become much shallower than before All right, I like this paper it's a lot of fun I mean like I said I, there's certain things I'm like very doubtful of but like it's trying to tackle the problems that we have in artificial intelligence in a new way it's basically this idea of symbiosis can we make um the kind of life we are symbio symbiotic with uh digital computers and uh it was completely unexplained the interface here um how that is actually done but they're saying maybe if we are to uh do that by somehow getting microcomputers into a living organism then we could have best of both worlds now just because computers are embedded inside a cell does that mean that they will actually understand the computer i don't think so any more than i understand what's going on in my phone like, I understand some things, but do I actually understand what's going on my phone? No, but that doesn't mean I can't interface with it. Viper says, yep, today you also learned that I also like Japanese philosophers straight to the point and recognize where he's being wishy-washy. Yeah, no, like, this is the thing, Vipers. You're going to find out, like, uh, I think it was on Aris's stream yesterday where he was like, look, when you get into philosophy, you're going to find out you hate, you fucking hate some people, and then you're also going to find people you like there is going to be some philosophers you're going to like and uh like this sort of stuff maybe the japanese philosophy is more along your lines um and there are stuff to read i'd suggest hitting up the scp article on japanese philosophy they have one you just noticed that martin screlly is on twitch also reading articles just and streaming haven't heard anything from that guy for ages interesting yeah well, uh, yeah, you're a computer scientist. You're going to deal with your precision. You're going to want your technicals. You're going to like formal philosophy. You can do mess here on your own. Yeah. Formal philosophy, there's a lot of formal philosophy out there. Deals with logic and all this, also this science-based stuff. So, but, uh, yeah. But, I mean, this is the thing. If you go back and read the Heidegger, you're going to lose your mind. It's Heidegger's metaphysics. But, like, the way it's been developed into an terms of because he talked about philosophy of technology so the way it's gone into into the technical field and it's had this uptake is really an important uh move in the 20th century the late 20th century because he was uh writing up and through the 70s yeah so sure it's like you're gonna find people you think are better and how this works now again I don't think this is going to work like because just because the computer is embedded in the cell that does not explain how it's going to interface with the cell that's more important um and why does it have to be inside it as opposed to being outside of it not explained but it's it's an idea that like maybe if it was at the rna level then like it would actually start to learn how to use it now that's an interesting problem but why does it have to be at the rna level and not be something it's interface interfacing with on the in the external world like if instead of um yeah like so why is the sl slime mold when it solves a problem solving a problem uh internally ex versus externally what does that actually have anything to do with the slime mold's life where the problem is whether it's an internal problem that has to be like purged from its system or an external problem where it has to find food like there's a relativity there of where is the external world and the external world doesn't matter it just has to be whatever isn't the cell whatever isn't the cell can be at the micro level or it can be also at the macro level like the cell has to deal with um 
you know, the the molecules it's using. The, at the molecular level, that's no longer the cell. That's just a chemical or, a, you know, a, you know a hydrogen or whatever, an atom. That is not the cell anymore. The cell has to somehow deal with the interaction of molecules, and it has already solved that problem as part of its structure. But once you get to that relatively smaller size, it is no longer part of the cell in some sense. That su that scale down that the authors here are using that is might as well be external to the cell because it is at a smaller scale. Like the internals of an atom have nothing to do with this the cell. But if they did, like the cell would have to you know be able to maintain the structure of what it's using of like of its cellular whatever like the pieces inside of it the mitochondria or whatever the dna or the rna and the cellular like the rna big breakdown there are repair things in the cell to fix broken dna and rna and so the cell already has to solve the problem at that micro level and so that's already something external to the cell the breakdown of the dna and the rna so you have to think about this stuff in a kind of a bit more sophisticated way it's just because it's outside the cell doesn't mean it's separate from the cellular the cell's life yeah a lot of speaking right there. Lucifero says, I would say all my time favorite, your all time favorite is Nietzsche. Most disliked philosopher would be Thomas Aquinas, excluding living philosophers. Very fair. Um, so, and I keep, this keeps crashing on me, which is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I borked my uh, Stream Deck software. I have to fix that. Viper says, going back to the Akira thing, it made me think of a phrase that has nothing to do with this discussion, but is too good not to mention. Nuclear technology creates superheroes in America, but monsters in Japan. Yeah, I mean, that has to do with our history with uh, the technology um, culture. But, um, yeah, absolutely. But this is the thing. Like, this is a kind of technology that we're afraid of here. I mean, the Japanese have, um, you know, Godzilla. And Godzilla is very, like, I, I think Godzilla is sometimes friendly, but a lot of these uh, things are uh, ambivalent to the people. So it's not, like, you have to be careful about this sort of thing. So, oh, what am I doing? Oh, I have the desktop audio. Oh, man, is this doubling my stuff? Shoot. My apologies if you were getting echoes on the music. So, yeah. Well... We have very, like, the Japanese culture and American and U.S. culture is, like, on some levels very different because of the history in the 20th century. But, like, and also the philo the philosophical um, thread that went through um, the history here, like, like I said, they had a strand of Heideggerian philosophy. People went and studied with Heidegger, some important philosophers, and then went back to Japan and brought some of these ideas there. And so, in some sense, they have a good... They have a different take on a lot of the technology than, you know, we have in the West because Heidegger, you know, his name is Mud recent, in recent years because of his uh, uh, Nazi sympathies and just being a Nazi in general. Um, but like they took things differently, but then they have their own problems because, of course, you know, the Germans and the Japanese were on the wrong side of World War Two. And so they had their own nationalism, their own problems. And so some of these philosophies are actually coming back into vogue because uh, we're finally separating out some of the social problems that, of the 20th century from the uh, philosophical ideas that some of these people had. Uh, yeah. There's actually going to be a class on Japanese philosophy at the Grad Center taught by Graham Priest next semester. Where he's going to be going into some of these things. I don't think I'm going to go to that class. But I mention it because I mentioned uh, Grand Priest before. Uh, to Vipers, I believe. Yeah. So. Okay. Any more things? I'm starting to lose my voice, unfortunately. And I, I hate to run when there's people here having a discussion. But my voice.